So the 15 inch MacBook Air is the perfect computer for about 95% of people. But for that other 5%, you could be making a huge mistake. Let me explain. So I think if you're considering purchasing a new MacBook, there's a few things you should care about. And for the most part, they can be bunched into three sections. So we have usability. This is things like battery life, what the display is like, what the speakers sound like, performance. Of course, this is how well your laptop handles your kind of day-to-day -day tasks and of course, more intensive tasks. And finally, cost. Is it worth it for the money? As well as whether that particular machine from Apple's lineup makes sense for you. So let's take a little journey through those sections while we talk about the M2 15 inch MacBook Air. So first of all, some context. This is my unique situation for wanting to buy this machine. And if you don't care about that, and you are kind of just want more info on things like the battery life, the performance, etc. you can go to this timestamp of the video. So I'm a professional videographer and photographer, meaning I sometimes have to travel for long periods of time using only my laptop and my main machine. At home, this is where I work full time. I have an M1 Max Mac Studio with 32 gigs of RAM. This is my main editing machine. Before owning my Mac Studio, I had a 16 inch M1 Pro MacBook Pro that I used for all of my editing. And I plugged it into the screens behind me when I was at home. It was a really good machine, I absolutely loved it. However, the only issue was it was heavy. And since getting the Mac Studio, I obviously didn't need my MacBook to do everything. And I hated the weight. So naturally, of course, I've been thinking about the MacBook Air. So knowing that, one of the main concerns about actually buying the 15 inch MacBook Air was of course the performance. And I needed to know that it was up to the work that I am required to do for my job. To help with that, I maxed out the RAM on this particular machine to the maximum Apple allows, which is 24 gigabytes. Considering I'm essentially maxing out a machine, the final price was around £2,000, which is actually pretty good considering it is a kind of Mac spec Mac. Hey guys, Tom from the editing room. So I have to admit, I don't really know what I was talking about when I was talking about this. So of course, the top spec for memory that you can get in this MacBook Air is 24 gigabytes. And that's what I was talking about in terms of maxing out. But you can, of course, go from 512 gigabytes of SSD storage to two terabytes of SSD storage. I actually always go for the baseline storage in my MacBooks uh, because I work almost entirely for work from external drives. So I never really need internal storage on my computers. So I prefer to save the money. Everything I was mentioning does tally. It does kind of make sense, but you kind of just disregard what I was talking about in terms of Mac spec because you can make that additional storage upgrade. So that's the context. Let's talk about some of the tangibles. First of all, the battery life. This one was a slightly mixed bag for me. It's actually very good unless you're using it for professional applications. Now, I guess that's to be slightly expected, but if I'm doing anything like kind of watching movies or web browsing, the performance on the battery is really good. Apple says it's up to 18 hours. I'm not totally sure about that, but you should be absolutely fine to get over 12 with light usage. For me, Final Cut Pro X absolutely destroyed the battery life here. I would say it goes down to like four to five hours of usage. But again, I work with pretty intense files uh, and I never really edit for long periods of time without plugging into power. So for me, this was absolutely fine. If you're buying the 15 inch MacBook Air over let's say the 13 inch, you wanna know what the display is like, as obviously that's the main reason you're actually buying this machine. And I'm really happy to report that it's absolutely top notch. And yes, I say notch, because of course there is still a notch on top of the screen. Honestly, for me, I hardly noticed this at this point, but of course some people might not like it. The resolution is absolutely gorgeous. The colors are fantastic. Coming from the 16 inch MacBook Pro, I'm completely happy with the slight reduction in screen size. To be honest, I almost don't know what more to say when we're talking about the display. It's an Apple display. It really is very, very good. And from the very good to the pretty average. And the speakers are an enormous downgrade for me from the 16 inch MacBook Pro. It's obviously understandable here. There's no speaker grills on the side of the keyboard uh, like you do get on the Pro. Instead, the speakers reside inside the hinge down here, but they just are not that high quality. Like they're okay for general usage, but are pretty tinny. And for instance, I was showing one of my clients a completed video the other day uh, and I have to always ensure that it was using headphones on because it just isn't good enough and it would have essentially made the video really underwhelming. And finally, in terms of usability, this computer is really light and really thin. I'm really happy about that because obviously, as I mentioned, it was one of the main reasons that I actually bought this machine in the first place. But like I said, happy to report, it really is pretty tiny and I barely notice it in my backpack. Okay, let's talk about performance. So first of all, I've already mentioned that I have the 24 gigabyte model of this machine. So I can't really comment on what the performance is like for the lower spec models like the uh, 8 gig because that's the baseline that this computer comes with. But I can report that the performance on my 15 inch MacBook Air has been 
really, really good. So in terms of a Geekbench score to kind of give a comparative baseline, on my MacBook Air 15 inch, I got a score of just under 10,000, which is almost up to the roughly 12,000 multi-core performance seen on my M1 Pro MacBook Pro. So on the surface, this would suggest that I've almost gotten the same performance, but with a big reduction in size, weight, and noise, as this MacBook doesn't actually have any active fans. And that's mostly true. The performance has been really fantastic and it has been way better than I actually thought it would. I was nervous about the performance of this machine, of course, and whether it would be able to keep up with the editing of big projects that I'm sometimes required to do. In fact, I just did a two week job, fast turnaround job in Monaco. I was turning around videos that were shot on a selection of professional cameras and this machine handled it like perfectly. It's been massively surprising and really very good. So you know that I mentioned that this machine has no fans. That does mean that we run into something called thermal throttling. In simple terms, what your machine is doing is it's limiting itself and its performance to ensure it doesn't overheat. And what that means is that with long extended tasks, because it won't essentially hit that thermal throttling limit until it actually does something intensive. So for instance, for tasks like exporting a long YouTube video, you are going to get slower performance than with an actively cooled machine. Again, though, in real terms, this wasn't a huge deal for me. And in general, performance like real-time editing, like timeline performance, photo editing, or Photoshop has actually been really, really good. Whilst I've been really happy with the performance, it's worth noting that this machine only has two USB-C ports and no SD card slot, which is definitely a bit inconvenient for me personally. I wish Apple had put an additional USB-C in this machine, since of course we have an increase in size over the 13-inch model, so it would be almost like a sensible use of space to add an extra USB-C port, but there's a chance that Apple doesn't want to cannibalize its MacBook Pro line. I personally have really missed access to more ports and an SD card slot, and it's one of the biggest downsides on this machine. So finally we come to the cost. And this is where the machine is both made and broken, in my opinion. So here's the issue. The 15-inch MacBook Air kind of sits in this slightly unique place where it's completely perfect for everyone that does, I would say, anything a bit more regular on a computer. It's also able to perform pretty intensive tasks like editing a two-week-long job shot on a variety of professional grey cameras. But I personally wouldn't want to use this as my main machine like kind of indefinitely. And I can't even totally explain why because the performance is good, it's just not quite good enough to be my only dedicated machine. Not to mention the configuration that I've gone for, like I mentioned, comes out to £2,000 or $2,000. That's certainly not cheap, even if it is a top spec Mac. And it's not too far off the 16 inch MacBook Pro. So again, we're left in this slightly weird conundrum and it's entirely dependent on why you're purchasing this machine. For me, the cost is fantastic because it replaces a more expensive MacBook, it's lighter, and it's almost just as powerful. But if you're a full-time creative or for instance, like a developer who doesn't have access to another machine, you might wanna look at a slightly more capable MacBook Pro to cope with those professional grade applications on a full-time basis. And speaking of professional grade applications, if you've ever wondered how an iPhone 15 Pro would perform against a much more expensive professional camera, you might like this video right here.